Welcome to the Financial Fitness Bunny Podcast, your number one stop shop to all things money management. My name is Nicolette Mashile. I'm also known as the Financial Bunny and I'm here to put lipstick on the money pig. Yes, I have been reading indeed, but this is a book that I read quite a number of times and I keep reading and I keep going back to it and I keep feeding my property beast. It is a book called Simple Steps to Property Wealth. It is by the gentleman called Jason Lee. He's written other books. He's written one called Making Money Out of Property in South Africa. But this one, he details the steps of how to get into the property industry pertaining to South Africa. And I, and I, and I say that because we've got a different type of property sector in South Africa versus other countries where it's a little bit more open. Here, I think one of the biggest um, um, motivators for property ownership in South Africa has always been um, ownership because obviously we come from a very painful past and many people didn't own their properties. Um, you know, spatial planning in South Africa also had a very big number on us, but also um, 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 the fact that for a very number of years, many black people could not get into the property sector. And in, 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 in still some instances, you know, the property sector is still very lily white um, and it's, it, it does need a little bit of washing and cleaning and really just mixing the diverse colors of South Africa to make sure that we are on the right track. Um, you often find people say, I can't get a home loan. Um, I'm not qualifying for a home loan. And we don't talk about some of the reasons why a number of people are still shut out of the property sector, especially if they are going to try to finance their property. So, so Jason Lee kind of details some of the steps and, and there are cheat codes in there in terms of how do you prepare yourself to qualify for a home loan if that's what you're looking for. How do you get into property if you don't have the huge capital? Um, so it's, it's, it's quite a book. Uh, I like it because it does, it also moves away from the narrative of property being only about ownership and it starts talking about property as a cornerstone of wealth creation and what are the simple steps that you can start exercising to put yourself into the right path of wealth creation through property and um, Jason points out some of the good the bad and the ugly of property investing and he shares some of his own personal experiences so it's always good when you've got a writer who is not writing from a theory based approach but from a practical approach where they've also been in the property decision uh, property uh, market and some of the decisions they've had to take in a very volatile property market in South Africa absolutely love this book um as I said, Jason Lee is 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 in the property sector. So he's got some great nuggets to share. Of course, do we need more books about property written in South Africa? Absolutely. I'm going to try to write a property book sometime in the next two years. Um, I'm still trying to gather myself in terms of um, property experience. Um, you know, I've, I've only been in the property space through investment, um, 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 a rent to buy or oh, buy to rent properties. We have bought properties to rent out to other people and then also property stock fell that we started in 2017 called Mikat Eko. So I've had a, a number of experiences, you know, in the property sector, but um, you never know enough. And, and, and for you to be able to really give people a true rendition. Oh, I, I had land at some point. Oh, please go to my YouTube channel to go and find out about that land issue. I sold that land. And I must tell you guys, it was the biggest scam of my life. But I won't, I will go back to buying land again. I am actually in the process of looking for farmland. Um, but yeah, that was a very, very interesting because I've always been on the buying side. So the selling side was quite an interesting side for me. So today I want to talk a little bit about your financial blind spots because yes, money does matter. And that's the episode we're going to be dealing with is how do you know your own financial blind spots? How do you know when you are the problem? And it's not the financial sector. It's not the laws. It's you. You, you are the problem. But some of these things, a lot of us are very unaware of them. We are either unaware of them or we just completely ignore them. But they are a deterrent when it comes to our money habits. It is, again, a chapter in my book, What's Your Move? The chapter is called The Supercharged 2 Million Rand. And I'll tell you the story of what happened. So a couple of years ago, I think back in 2015, I posted a Range Rover spot, the last number. I wanted to buy a Range Rover, Okay. And, and, and years, I've been going back to a Range Rover dealership to go and check how much is this thing? You know, how much is this car? You know, so, so the one time I walked into a Range Rover um, and I was looking at 
you know, some of the cars that were, were, were put on the, on the floor. But when I walked in, before I walked in, I was already undermined by the sales guy. In fact, they didn't even give me any attention. You know, like, you undermine me. And I guess maybe it's because I arrived there in my VW Skiroko. And he probably thought, how do you jump from a VW Skiroko to um, a, a, v- a, a, a Range Rover? I mean, sir, I did. But that's not the point of the story today. But I guess maybe he looked at me. He was just like, I, nah, this one. This is not the girl that is going to make help me reach my target today. So they blatantly ignored me. Um, which was fine. I walked in still. I looked at some of the cars. And you know what? They were right to ignore me. Because when I realized that the Range Rover, the supercharged was 2 million rand, the one that was on the floor. And by the way, there was even a second-hand one. I was like, ah, me as Nicolette, I don't have 2 million rand for a car, okay? At that time, I did not have it. I did not really have it. And this is the beauty of our life, is that where you are today might not have, you might not even have a 180 for a VW. You might not even have 100K for whatever car is 100K. You might not have it, but that is not you. That is not where you start. That is not where you end. It is you in the present moment. And that is why it's important to have awareness and to live in reality. I tell people, people either live, live in the past or they live too far into the future that they miss the magic of now. And it's important to not miss the magic of now when it comes to your finances because that's when you, ma- you make very bad mistakes. You may even miss some of your own financial blind spots because you are working with ego. You know, the Nicolette, how can I not drive a Range Rover? No, you're not there yet. Relax. Nicolette is going to be your name even after five years. You're still going to be the same Nicolette. You can say this Nicolette drives a Range Rover. But that Nicolette then drove a VW and I was comfortable. It was paid off. You know, what was I trying? I had no business trying to take up an installment of 20K, guys. I had zero, zero business trying to take up an installment of 20K, moving from not paying anything for years. Now, all of a sudden, I think I can pay 20K every single month for a car. And you must relax, okay? And that is why it's important to be able to identify some of these blind spots that you've got because your ego is a financial blind spot for many of us. Ego, looking too far into the future, and wanting to live the Nicolette of the future instead of the Nicolette of today. That's an ego issue. Very, very big. So make sure that you are looking at some of these things. Ask yourself. Have a fair and honest conversation. And I'm not saying do it now while you're sitting on this podcast. I'm sure some of the things would have sprung up to your brain as I'm talking about it. But don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up. Ego does not just pop out of nowhere. Because often we, 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 we act as if like some of these bad habits that we've got or these blind spots or whatever, pitfalls, we think they're like, I'm a bad person. No, your ego somehow had to be built for it to become that way. And it goes back again to how you were brought up. I always tell people, I had to be overconfident. I didn't have a choice. For me to survive some of the environments that my parents had put us into, we had to. You can imagine an eight-year-old Nicolette. I'm supposed to be going to grade five. I get to this multiracial school called Nelspray Primary School. And they say to me, I'm too young to go to grade five. So I'm forced to repeat grade four. So already I'm, my ego is knocked. Secondly, I cannot speak the language that the school teaches in. That is English. Thirdly, I cannot speak the language that the people who look like me, the black kids in the school speak. That is Isiswati. Coming from Bush Park Ridge, there's already a problem there in Bush Park Ridge because there's a language called Sepulana that I'm born into, but other people are speaking Setonga. Couldn't mix masala, then they sepedi. So I'm already having a language delay. Then I'm put into this environment where my mom and the structure of having a mom is stripped away from myself. I have to live in a flat because the school doesn't have a boarding house. I don't speak English that the school is being, my, I'm being taught in. I don't speak Isiswati that the people who look like me are speaking. Basically, I am lost. And then I'm made to repeat grade four. Yes. So what is my coping mechanism? Is to become overly dependent on myself. I become overly independent. I become overly confident because I've got to fake it to make it on a daily basis. But that carries through out my entire life. Then people sit and say, why is this girl so confident? Why is this girl got so much of an ego? Why is she so arrogant? Because that was my coping mechanism for years. So it happens. But I have to identify that. And I need to know that it can become a deterrent 
in my own personal life, whether from a financial perspective, whether from relationships, whether from creating friendships with people, it becomes a problem. And I need to be able to identify it, right? So some of the pitfalls that I identified in the book that I was personally struggling with. One of them is the tendency to panic, being anxious, panicking about everything. Guys, you know, with with confidence, you don't panic because you can't let people see that you panic. So one of the things I used to say when I was working in advertising, because in advertising, I can tell you, things can go from right to left very quickly (laughs) when you've got a client that they themselves are dealing with their own childhood and emotional traumas they will take it out on everybody if you're and i think one of my clients must have had like a tough life you know in their home and she took out her anger on everybody every single day so she made everybody panic and i would sit there and say why are you guys panicking because remember i have learned not to panic because i had every reason to panic but I had learned over the years that panicking doesn't solve anything. So I would ask people, why are you panicking? Relax. If it's going to work out, it's going to work out. And I'll make it work. I'm the hero in the story. Don't worry, you know? So it's important to be able to identify it if you are the type of person who's anxious, if you panic a lot. Because panicking and finance do not have a good relationship. Okay? You can't make this month's payment. Now you panic. So you, what do you do? You panic. And when you panic, you can't find good solutions. So you ignore. Oh. But when you ignore, you create bigger problems. Instead of picking up the phone and saying to the bank, Alalalanbo babes, me, I'm not going to make my car installment this month. <laughs> because we are better. But instead, what do we do? We panic. We don't call the bank. We pretend like the problem is not there. Now you are in arrears. Now it's a bigger problem. So it's important to make sure that you identify these types of things when you are about to panic. This is a pitfall. It's a blind spot because it can create, even in investing. Oh my goodness, we had a lockdown. Okay, flights were grounded. Which means if you've got Comair shares, if you've got shares in oil, this is a disturbance in the economy. So what do people do? They panic. What do they do? They sell. So they sold their shares. It's what happens. So it's important to be able to identify these types of things. The next one, putting an age against financial accomplishments. I cannot stress this enough. Stop it. People come to me in my coaching classes and they say, I am 35 and I don't have this and I don't have that. And I'm like, you are going to be 40 and you're still not going to have these things. What are you going to do then? Because things are going to become even more scarier, my sister. Because we're putting too much pressure on ourselves based on age. Oh, I'm 35, I don't have kids. I'm 35, I don't have a husband. I'm 35, I don't have a car. I'm 35, I'm 20, I don't have this. And I'm like, ooh, at 20, I didn't even think about these things. Me at 20, I was trying to get over a hangover. When now you're here worrying about having a car. Please, man, you guys are even lucky. We didn't even have Uber then. You guys have Uber now. You can go anywhere without a car. Like, what are you stressing about? Oh, I'm this age and I don't have this. Oh, I'm this age. Relax. I know it's difficult. And I, and, I, and I sound like I'm trying to make fun of it. I know it's difficult. We all go through it. I've gone through it. I've gone through it. I'm like, oh my goodness, unmarried, childless. What's going on with my life? Nothing is going on with your life, okay? Nothing. You are living. Start making the right financial decisions so that those things come anywhere. And when they come, they come at whatever age. And you are going to be happy when they come. It can never be, I don't have a house, but I'm 33 years old. The problem is that y'all talk too much on Twitter and then we sit there and we're like, oh, you don't even have a car with that mouth of yours. I'm just joking. Yeah, no, I'm dealing with my own problems. (laughs) But please, guys, time, age, do away with those checklists. They are going to make you stagnant. They're going to make you feel like a failure. And there's nothing that can ever be grown out of soil that is not fertile for growth. The only time you can make your soil fertile for growth is when you believe things were going to happen and they're going to happen at their time. You just need to do your part. Because the thing about success is that it's got a mixture of luck in it. It's got a mixture of luck. People talk about Uncle Waffles and they say, "Ah, Uncle Waffles is what, what, the luckiest DJ we've ever seen. How come people like this DJ and that DJ took so long for the... It's sometimes about hard work and luck. Sometimes the imbalance happens. There's luck and then there's hard work. Then there's hard work and there's luck. But you've got to be in the mix of both of those two things. 
Because when you actually work hard and you work smart, you actually can create luck pockets. So it's important to understand that. But also important is that luck will get you there, but it won't keep you there. So you may buy the car at 20, you may buy your Porsche, but will you have it at 23? It's important to understand those. It's not always about hitting those things. It's also about hitting them and sustainably being able. I've seen this around on Twitter. People say, when God gives you what you've been praying for, pray for the ability to be able to keep it. And I'm like, this is it. People want to reach milestones at a certain age, but forget that they still need to be able to keep those milestones going, even after that age. I know people who've had Porsches. I know people who have homes who've had to lose them. Because actually, when they got them at those age, they did not, they were not prepared for it. But I also know people who got their things at 23 and things have been easy for them. And there's not a, anything wrong with that. But don't want certain things because you are reaching a certain age. You know that is an old way of living. I mean, geez, we've got Uber now. We've got Chat GPT. We've got some crazy amazing things now you can still be holding on to beliefs of the past when we have so many amazing things please people don't even have cell phones or laptops come on guys please you even know english our people didn't know english when they were growing up no you can't be that person the next one being overly confident it can be a pitfall because being overly confident means that you don't leave leave room for learning you know too much. You discuss everything. You are the main guy. You can't be the most smartest person in every room. You will never learn anything. In fact, in fact, you start to cheapen the intelligence that you assume you have. So it's important that you don't become too overconfident. Sometimes allow yourself to make mistakes. Sometimes be a student. Be the person who is starting from scratch because that allows, sometimes ask questions. Don't be so confident that you don't allow yourself to ask questions. This is how people end up with balloon payments of 45% because you are afraid to ask because you are so confident you know everything. There's nothing wrong with not knowing. There's nothing wrong with not being confident. There's nothing wrong. So make sure that you don't allow overconfidence Because overconfidence often comes from past experiences and past performance or, you know, it's that thing of there's there's, there's a a bias about, um, we always talk about the things that worked and not the things that didn't work. So we, 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 we speak about the survivors. We never speak about the people who died, you know? Oh, but five people survived. Yeah, but a hundred died. What you talking about? This thing is not a good thing. So it's very important to not be overconfident about everything. The next one, procrastinating. I will go wholly on you on procrastination. And I'll tell you that procrastination is you not believing in the ability that God has given you because you think you got time. Then tomorrow you're dead. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that yeah. I'm going to say stop putting things off. I'm going to put it as bluntly as it is. Stop putting things off and saying I'm going to do it later and later and later. Just before COVID hit us and we went into a lockdown, I was at a conference, Health Matters or something like Health is Wealth. It was done by Dr. Kanyile and her partner. And there was a young lady at that conference who asked me about um, retrenchment cover. And I said, listen, I don't know a lot about financial products. I think you need to speak to a financial um, advisor. But what I can tell you is that there are certain insurances or life covers and, you know, um, long-term insurances that do have retrenchment as a, a benefit to them. So find out. And I said, you know, with even some credit cards have retrenchment as a benefit. So go and find out. She said, yeah, we'll do that. 21st of March, our country got locked. Company started to lose profits. Her company was retrenching. And she called me and said, Nicolette, I don't know. By some divine intervention. I had put off getting this retrenchment cover or looking into it. But somehow, just before COVID hit us, I went and I got it. And look at us now. Sometimes we procrastinate and it is a financial pitfall or a blind spot because it, you know, I was actually, so one of the artists, what's his name? 
Loaga Bibbs passed away from a stroke. And um, as we were talking about, you know, obviously as this news and condolences to, to, to Babes and her family, as this news was hitting, people were putting out prevention for strokes. And one doctor said, you know, a stroke actually tells you months ahead that it's coming. And they were talking about these signs that you must look out for, you know, if you have a moment where your face feels numb, try to smile. And if one side of your face is not smiling, it means that you may potentially have a stroke later on in life. And I was saying the funniest thing about many things in finance is that you will hear about it today. It may happen three months later to you. You may hear about investing today. Three months later, you hear. It's like people who heard about buying Capitec shares when Capitec was coming up and they didn't buy them. If you look at how much Capitec listed by, 3.70 or 3.50. The Capitec share today is crossed over by 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So it's important that when something is potentially part of what you can use to build your financial strategy, don't procrastinate on it it because knowledge is not powerful until it becomes actionable knowing about things and putting them off is a big 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 blind spot the next one is being lured into this false sense of financial security because you have a big salary for instance because your salary comes every month so you've got a sense of financial stability it's important to not believe in 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 stability that is external but it's not solid yes a job is good everybody needs job security but what happens if you lose that job what happens if that company disappears we've seen some fly by night companies in this country so your financial blind spots are ultimately a way for you to just remind yourself that you are not a machine, you are human. You may have those financial blind spots. I, I, I once consulted on a, a lady and I was telling her that her financial blind spots, some of it are very psychological. She came to me and she was panicking about anything. She could not make investments because she wanted to keep money in her bank account because what if something happens? What if this happens? I then sent her to a clinical psychologist to go speak to this clinical psychologist. When the clinical psychologist sent me back the report, she said she's anxious because when she was growing up, her mom passed away and left them with no financial security. And she has a daughter of her own. So she's afraid that if she passes away, her daughter won't have the financial security. It's all psychological. Her blind spots are all psychological. They come from trauma. Very, very important to make sure that you are very much well aware, but you're also doing something because being aware of your financial blind spots, but not doing anything about it, that in itself just perpetuates these blind spots so that they blind you for real and you get into an accident. So make sure that you are aware of them and you are seeking the help. Some of them are not even financial. They've got a financial implication, but they're not financial by nature. Some of them is just usile. Usile as muntu. Muntu usile. Sort out ugusa wako and understand why usile. And you may just find that you make better financial decisions after that. Sometimes it's about vocabulary. Your financial blind spot might be vocabulary because you don't have the grammar and the vocabulary to be able to explain to a financial expert, a professional, a financial advisor, a planner, a wealth manager, to explain to them what exactly is your need. So because they don't understand, it's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, what's wrong? And you give them all of the other things instead of the thing that's really wrong because you don't have the grammar to say, my spleen is painful because our lazy is spleen. Can't say my pancreas is sore because you don't know. So you say my stomach is sore. So the doctor is doing diagnostics on your stomach. But the thing that's really sore, you are not explaining correctly because you don't have the vocabulary. That can be a financial blind spot. Very, very important to make sure that you understand that these are your blind spots and you've got to work towards them. I hope this helps you in managing your money. Because at the end of the day, we're in this together. We're in this together and every day, if we, if we dedicate our time to learning more, we'll become more at managing our money. You know why? Because yes, money does matter. I will see you guys on the next one as we get more and more and deep and deeper into putting lipstick on this financial page.